The World Stroke Organization says one in every four people will have stroke in their lifetime. One stroke is reported every three seconds and there are 12.2 million new strokes per year. In the last 30 years, the number of stroke patients have doubled and at the moment 101 million are living with its aftermath, majority of them in low to middle income countries. To talk on the global graph of stroke, the reasons behind it and ways to prevent it, today we are joined in our new studio by US-based neurologist Amit Kadel. He is also the stroke director at Kaleida Health Buffalo General Medical Center and he is also associate professor of neurology and emergency medicine at the University at Buffalo. Th thank you, Sarah. I really ap appreciate this opportunity to be here. You are here as part of a campaign to raise awareness on stroke and how has the Kathmandu weather greeted you so far? It's re really good, actually. We just completed uh, the first International Congress of Nepalese Academy of Neurology, and that was a big success. It was awesome work by Dr. Oli and Ravindra Shrestha, and uh, that's the beginning. And uh, the neurology team in uh, Nepal are ready to take another step. I'm sure you get asked this often everywhere you go. In the simplest of language, what is stroke and how can it affect one's life? Yes, so a stroke is a disease that starts with the blood vessel problem. That blood vessel problem can be a clot blocking the blood vessel or blood vessel bursting in the brain, causing the brain injury. And that brain injury can be fatal or if it's not a fatal, then it will leave um, residual effect, causing, causing lifelong disability. Um, if they don't get appropriate treatment, only 20% may uh, return back to their usual lifestyle. And even that is not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the demographics of it. How is it across gender, age, and also the geographical factors? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, the stroke itself is control, all the outcome is controlled by the social determinants of health. How we live, where we live, matter most. And it's the risk-taking behavior. Along with that, there are biological factors also. If we count the number of a stroke, women get more than men, just because they live longer. But if we look at the age of onset, men get the stroke younger, those are more disabling and that uh, does um, kill more uh, in men. Uh, some of it is related to more risk-taking behavior like uh, smoking, not exercising, not having a good diet, uh, and there are multiple things. So uh, it is variable. When you said about social construct, it reminds me of one of the lines that you, you've used in your presentation. Stroke is more a political and social issue than it is medical. What do you mean by that? Let's, if we could break it down, yes. to begin with political. Yes, so what happens is um, any, any disease, any uh, non-communicable or chronic diseases, there are biological component and there are social component. And now we have realized that 45% of outcome is only decided by biology. 55% of outcome is social. Now, just for example, a stroke. It's a really, really deadly as well as fatal disease. But there are 36 neurologists in Nepal. Those neurologists are able to treat one or two patients. But even those are not treated appropriately if they are not provided with the system. Uh, before 1995, a stroke was considered as um, a disease that cannot be treated. Then in 1995, a landmark trial happened. And that trial showed that if we use a clot-busting medication within three hours, then those patients who get the medication within three hours, 30% of them will go back to work. And that changed the mindset. Actually, that medication was supposed to open the clot in the blood vessel, but it actually opened the mindset mm -hmm. in the people who are treating it. Uh, and then along with that blood vessel problem or blood vessel, blood clot busting medication, the hospital system also had to be optimal. What I mean by that is there was a start of a stroke system of care. The hospital has to be ready 
so that any time a patient with a stroke symptom enters the door, in my hospital, the door to needle time target is 30 minutes. We do everything so that that patient gets that clot busting medication within 30 minutes. If it's delayed than 30 minutes, then we have to have a valid reason why we are delaying. Um, because of that, then the hospital system became a little bit more organized for one disease. All the multiple discipline mm -hmm. came in one place to fight against this disease. And then the complication rate went down. The secondary prevention, one day, once the stroke happens, there are ways to prevent. And there is a whole new world of rehabilitation. Now, even if someone has a weakness or any other type of even cognitive or speech problem, if they get enough rehab, they do much better than people who do not. Mm. So because of that stroke system, uh, system of care, then the outcome is started to be better. And then in 2014 or 16, 14 or 15, then five other landmark trial happen. And that showed that there is a way of treat, treatment called thrombectomy, where uh, in interventional radiologists or interventional neurologists or interventional neurosurgeon can pass a catheter through the blood vessel in the arm or in the groin, and they can pass the wire to the brain in the blood vessel and pull out the clot. And that was the most disabling and most fatal type of a stroke. Now that also can be treated. In order to do that treatment, we have to have a stroke system of care. Mm -hmm. And one hospital cannot do it. One neurologist cannot do it. Now there are multiple component of system of care. So there is a pre-hospital where the ambulance has to be ready. Every time the patient recognizes a stroke symptoms, they have to call 102. Once they call 102, the ambulance or emergency medical service technician will inform the hospital that the stroke patient is coming so that the, all the multidisciplinary team can go to triage and wait for that patient. Then only we can make that door to needle time within 45 minutes or within 30 minutes. And then the, the clot busting medication will be costly. Right, it's a 65 to 91,000. Um, it's a very cost-effective treatment, but for one in, in terms of U.S. dollars or uh, Nepalese rupees, mm -hmm. uh, 65 to 90,000 mm -hmm. for uh, clot-busting medication, four to 11 lakh for uh, Nepalese rupees for the thrombectomy devices, and along with that, they need an extra setup, and that cannot happen with the initiative from the neurology or only neurology academy or the hospital. That has to come from the government. And the political willpower and governance is more important. So it's, it's disease recognition, right? So that's a marketing campaign that has to come from the government level. Uh, people have to recognize stroke comes with six major symptoms. Um, First one is any new type of headache or severe headache, unusual headache uh, that the person has never experienced. That's number one. Number two is a balance problem. They are, were able to walk normally, but now they cannot walk. Number three is eye problem, whether they are not able to see one side or there is a complete vision loss. Uh, number four is speech problem or confusion. They are not able to get the words out or they are not able to understand. Uh, fifth is one-sided numbness, uh, whether it's face, arm, or leg, they are not able to feel. And the sixth one is one-sided weakness, the face weakness, arm weakness, leg weakness, or all of it. If one of those symptoms occurs, then we want them to call 911. If the caregiver or a family member recognizes those symptoms, then we want them to call 102. Okay? So once that's done, then only the appropriate treatment can happen. Right now, if you look on the road, ambulance signal is going, but no one is giving uh, those uh, ambulance uh, to pass, right? And that's not the fault of the driver in other vehicle, hmm. because they don't know that one minute delay in the treatment is going to injure 1.9 million brain cell. If we can make the campaign to let everyone know that one minute delay in treatment of a stroke will cause 1.9 million 
uh, brain cell death. 10 minute will be equivalent to 19 million. 100 minute is 190 million. If every driver, every family member, every patient knows that fact, then no one is going to delay mm. or not give that uh, space for mm. that uh, ambulance to mm. pass. So what is, what is the safe uh, period of uh, time that a patient needs to absolutely get medical treatment? At any time, the, whenever they recognize a stroke symptoms, if they go to hospital even delayed, mm. we can help. Okay. But there are a few, uh, we call it time clock, uh, up to 4.5 hour we, uh, from onset we can give clot busting medication, mm -hmm. that's proven. Up to six hour, we can do um, uh, that thrombectomy where they can take the clot out. Mm -hmm. But that's only a time clock. There are other ways to uh, decide and we call that a tissue clock. We look at the MRI, we look at the CT. If someone had the symptom onset when they are sleeping and they wake up with the symptom, then we don't know when it is started. In those cases, we call those wake up stroke. And if they go to the hospital, then we do M immediate MRI. And based on MRI sequence, we can know that up to 65 to 70% that this is within 4.5 hour or more. And if it's within 4.5 hour, we can do it. Okay. Similarly with thrombectomy, based on the imaging criteria, we can even do the procedure after 24 hour. Mm. And even if we don't do clot busting medication and thrombolysis, there are other things. That's only one part of stroke treatment. Okay. Quickly, what are the changes in lifestyles or what can we do to prevent a stroke? That's an excellent question. 90% of a stroke is preventable. And almost 80 to 90, 80 to 85% of a stroke risk is because of five things. 90% is because of 10 things. And those are modifiable. Number one is high blood pressure. Uh, if we look at the risk attribution in Nepal, 64% of stroke risk is related to blood pressure. If blood pressure or high, hypertension is identified and treated, then 64% of stroke can be prevented. Secondly, it's the diet. Uh, diet has two components. One good thing in diet, that's fruit, vegetable, and fibers. And the bad thing in diet, like extra unnecessary calorie, salt, sugary uh, drink, or if we add sugar in tea and coffee, those also counts. Uh, that's number two. Number three in Nepal is uh, air pollution. And air pollution directly contributes to a stroke and heart attack. Similarly, body weight. Higher the body weight, more is the risk. Physical inactivity. People may be physically active at work, that does not count. It has to be a laser time physical activity. That means that going to a gym or having a park nearby in every community, then if they are going to those park or if gym is easily accessible, then that will reduce the risk of a stroke. Tobacco, that's an extremely high, high risk taking behavior. Now I equate air pollution as a smoking of the country. And that's where I meant by political. If country has a, a pollution of this level, mm -hmm. then the stroke risk is extremely high. And a neurologist or a hospital would not be able to do it. Great. And to add more blood sugar, diabetes control, cholesterol control. So if, if and then there are heart diseases, uh, there is a condition called atrial fibrillation, which is one of the major risk of a stroke. If these conditions are controlled, then 90% of a stroke is preventable. Great. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Karel. Thank you.